When it comes to making large returns on your investments, investing in promising ICOs can be an effective strategy. Initial coin offerings let you buy coins or tokens long before they list on exchanges and often at a significant discount. The problem is that most ICOs aren't very good, and those that are good see so much demand that you're lucky if you get a chance to buy. One of these highly anticipated ICOs took place a couple of months ago for MENA, the native token of the MENA protocol. The investors who managed to get a spot in the MENA sale queue have already seen a 10 to 20x return on investment, but money isn't the only thing that has people talking about the MENA protocol. Today, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about the world's lightest blockchain. What it is, how it works, and why the MENA token is one you have to keep your eyes on. I hate to be a bother, but there's a disclaimer I need to say before you go any further. I'm not a financial advisor, and that means I can't tell you how to invest. You need to do your own research, and watching educational videos like this one is one of the ways to do it best. If you're here because YouTube recommended this video to you, my name is Guy and crypto is what I do. My mission is to create the highest quality crypto content on the internet. Coins, tokens, news, and reviews. If your favorite crypto topic is missing, it just means I haven't covered it yet. To make sure you're around when I get around to it, subscribe to the channel and ping that notification bell quick. I've planted a few timestamps in the video timeline that you can use to teleport to the sections that tickle your fancy. If you watch the whole way through, though, that will really help me. That's enough prologue. Let's get in to MENA Protocol. MENA Protocol was created by computer scientists Evan Shapiro and Isaac Meckler. Evan and Isaac have been close friends since high school and have been dabbling in cryptocurrency tech since 2011. Evan mentioned in an interview that the pair didn't take cryptocurrencies too seriously until the 2017 bull run when they realized that all the cryptocurrencies on the market had the same fatal flaw. Now, as you all know, every cryptocurrency has a blockchain that stores its transaction history. Each block in that chain has a standard size, and new blocks are created at regular intervals. For example, Bitcoin's block size is one megabyte, and a new block is created every 10 minutes. Every time a new block is added to the Bitcoin blockchain, this increases the size of the Bitcoin blockchain by one megabyte. Bitcoin miners need to store Bitcoin's blockchain history to make sure they're processing the correct transactions so they can earn BTC. Bitcoin nodes add security to Bitcoin by keeping an up-to-date copy of the Bitcoin blockchain. Now, Bitcoin nodes do not earn BTC for doing this, but many companies which hold or accept BTC as payment run a full node to enhance its security, and nodes are where most of Bitcoin's security comes from. As the Bitcoin blockchain grows, it becomes harder for Bitcoin miners and Bitcoin nodes to store Bitcoin's transaction history. Today, Bitcoin's blockchain is about 350 gigabytes large. Now, Evan and Isaac argue that it's only a matter of time before cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin become so large that only a handful of miners and nodes will be able to store their transaction histories. This gradual centralization means that cryptocurrencies would become vulnerable to attack and manipulation. Cryptocurrencies could even become so centralized that they would be no different from today's financial system. At the time, Isaac was studying his PhD in cryptography and knew that it was possible to use zero-knowledge technology to compress the size of a cryptocurrency blockchain into the size of a few tweets. Realizing that they had found the solution to crypto's critical problem, Evan and Isaac co-founded a software company in San Francisco called O1 Labs in 2017 to create the CODA protocol. CODA protocol rebranded to MENA protocol in September 2020 because of a 2019 lawsuit by an enterprise blockchain developer called R3, which said that CODA's name was too similar to its CORDA blockchain. Although O1 Labs develops and maintains the MENA protocol, it's technically owned by the MENA Foundation, a non-profit in the Cayman Islands that was incorporated in February of this year. The MENA mainnet went live in mid-March after nearly three years of development, sponsored by some of the biggest VCs in crypto, including Multicoin Capital, Polychain Capital, and Coinbase Ventures. 
The MENA Foundation conducted the MENA Token ICO in April, and the MENA Token began trading at the end of May. Now, I'll get back to the MENA Token in a moment. But first, let's take a look at how the MENA protocol actually works. In a sentence, the MENA protocol is a smart contract compatible proof of stake cryptocurrency blockchain that's designed to have a constant blockchain size of 22 kilobytes. Now, for context, that's about three times the size of the little Coin Bureau logo you see beneath the view count in the video description. This is possible thanks to MENA's use of something called zero knowledge proofs, which were co created by MIT professor and Algorand founder Silvio Micali. Zero knowledge proofs make it possible to prove something without needing to provide any information to support that proof. Now, I know this can be really hard to wrap your head around, so here's a super simple analogy to help. Imagine you came across a massive chunk of solid gold buried in your backyard, and you wanted to tell all your friends about it. You know they're going to be skeptical about your discovery, so you're going to need to provide them with evidence. Now, there are two ways you can do this. Either you can bring that massive chunk of gold and physically show it to each friend, or you can take a photo of it and show them that instead. In the context of cryptocurrency, bringing over the physical gold for your friends to check is the equivalent of needing to download a cryptocurrency blockchain's transaction history. It's not easy, it's not efficient, and it's very hard to scale, since you have to carry all that gold to each friend, and that takes a lot of time. In the context of cryptocurrency, the photo of your golden discovery is a snapshot of a cryptocurrency's blockchain transaction history. This is easy, efficient, and also very easy to scale because you're taking around a photo instead of a heavy chunk of physical gold, which means you can show it to each friend faster. MENA protocol takes this idea to the next level by using something called recursive zero-knowledge proofs. Instead of turning every transaction and block into a 22 kilobyte snapshot, each additional transaction and block becomes a part of the same 22 kilobyte snapshot. Now let's continue the previous analogy to understand how that works. So, after digging up the gold in your backyard, you get a feeling that there's more money to be found on your property. So you start digging up your front yard. Lo and behold, you happen to find a small box containing a bunch of tiny diamonds. Naturally, you're going to want to tell your friends about the box of diamonds too. So you really want to show off both discoveries. So you decide to take a photo of both together. Now there's just one problem, and that's that the piece of gold is so large that the box of diamonds is barely visible if you take a photo of both together. Not only that, but you know one of your friends is a rather grubby fellow who would snatch some of your diamonds from the box if you carried it around to show people. To make life simple then, you take a photo of the box of diamonds, you put it next to the photo of the gold, and then you take a photo of both, so you only have to carry one photo as proof. This is basically how recursive zero-knowledge proofs work. They're a photo of a set of photos. Technically speaking, a proof of a proof of a set of proofs. Now, one important thing to note is that zero-knowledge proofs in cryptocurrency aren't exactly like photos in this analogy, since they don't actually reveal any data. That's why zero-knowledge proofs are used by some privacy coins like Zcash, and it's why MENA's blockchain can stay at 22 kilobytes even though more data is technically being added to it. Obviously, all of MENA's zero-knowledge proofs don't come out of thin air. Someone needs to do the work to take all these snapshots, and this brings me to MENA's blockchain architecture. There are three key participants on the MENA blockchain. These are verifiers, block producers, and snarkers. Verifiers on MENA are like nodes on Bitcoin. Verifiers add security to the MENA blockchain by holding that 22 kilobyte zero knowledge proof. Because 22 kilobytes is such a small amount of data to download, this makes it possible to turn everyone on MENA into a verifier. Block producers on MENA are like miners on Bitcoin. They create blocks containing transactions and earn MENA tokens from transaction fees and block rewards. The difference is that MENA's block producers only store the current state of the blockchain and send a snapshot of this state to verifiers. MENA also uses a proof-of-stake consensus mechanism instead of a proof-of-work. Now, MENA's proof of stake is a modification of Cardano's Ouroboros proof of stake, which makes it possible for MENA to have no limit 
on the number of block producers that can join its blockchain. Not only that, but there is no minimum stake to become a block producer on Mina, nor are there any slashing penalties for misbehavior. Block producers earn block rewards based on how much Mina they've staked relative to other block producers, and anyone can delegate their Mina to block producers to earn a cut of their block rewards. Now, snarkers on Mina are the ones tasked with taking snapshots of all the transactions taking place on the blockchain. They do not need to stake any Mina to do this. Interestingly, Block producers pay snarkers for this service using a cut of their block rewards, and multiple snarkers can bid for the same transaction snapshots on a marketplace called the um, Snarketplace. Snarkers can also take snapshots of transactions in parallel, and the snapshots they take don't immediately have to go into the current block either. This is for cryptographic reasons that I honestly do not understand. Anyways, even with all this complexity, a MENA transaction is not all that different from a Bitcoin transaction. When a MENA transaction is made, it goes into a pool of pending transactions that are picked by block producers based on how high the transaction fee is. If the transaction fee is too low, it doesn't get included in a block. Once the block producer has selected the transactions it wants to include in a block, snarkers take snapshots of these transactions and bid to have their snapshots chosen by the block producer. After choosing the snarkers who gave the most competitive bids, the block producer takes a snapshot of all the transaction snapshots in their block. The block producer then takes a snapshot of the current blockchain state, and this snapshot gets sent to verifiers, which can use it to confirm that the current state of the blockchain is valid. This top-of-the-line crypto tech makes it possible for Mina to do crazy things, like prove you have a high credit score to decentralized applications, without revealing your identity or your credit score. What's more is that Mina doesn't require a data oracle like other cryptocurrency blockchains. It can just take a snapshot of data relevant to the decentralized application from multiple websites. Mina is even working to make it possible to turn email accounts into zero-knowledge proof snapshots, meaning you could log into applications using your email without actually revealing your email address. I know your head is also probably about to explode right now, so let's turn to Mina's tokenomics and price action before that happens, shall we? Mina is the native token of the Mina protocol. Mina is used for staking and will eventually be used for governance of the Mina protocol. Mina has an initial supply of 1 billion tokens with no maximum supply. Mina's annual inflation rate is 12%, and this will drop to 7% after two years. This inflation schedule can be modified by community vote. Of Mina's initial supply, just over 20% was sold to private investors across three funding rounds. The price of Mina during these rounds ranged from $0.07 cents to $0.15, cents, raising just under $30 million in total. 6% was allocated to the Mina Foundation, 7.5% was allocated to O1 Labs, and over 23% was allocated to the founders and early team. 34% of MENA's initial supply has been earmarked for various community incentives, and only 7.5% was sold during the MENA ICO on CoinList for $0.25 cents each. This raked in another $18.7 million. MENA's initial allocations are subject to various vesting schedules, which can be seen here. One important thing to note is that the tokens allocated to the Foundation, Team, and O1 Labs are subject to, quote, self-enforced lockups, which means all their tokens are technically accessible. When you combine MENA's vesting schedule with its base inflation, MENA's effective annual inflation rate is somewhere in the neighborhood of 300%. That's a lot of supply-side pressure, and as basic economics dictates, if supply is greater than demand, then prices will fall. This seems to be the case with MENA as it has been in deep red over the last week. That said, the crypto market in general has been bleeding ever since the crash in May. As an altcoin, MENA is highly correlated to Bitcoin, and we all know what Bitcoin has been up to recently. Once the markets get back on track, however, I think that MENA could see some impressive price action, and this is for three reasons. First, MENA has a small market cap, and this means that it wouldn't take much money to push up its price compared to larger cryptocurrencies. 
Second, there is a high likelihood that MENA will get listed on more reputable exchanges in the coming weeks, specifically on Coinbase. As you'll perhaps recall, Coinbase Ventures backed the MENA protocol, and this is one of the commonalities that many cryptocurrencies on Coinbase have. Now, you can figure out if your favorite crypto has a shot of getting listed on Coinbase by watching my video about that using the link up there in the top right. Now, the third reason why MENA has a lot of upside potential has to do with its relationship to Ethereum. For those who don't know, Ethereum founder Vitalik Buterin is a huge fan of zero-knowledge technologies because they can help Ethereum scale. It shouldn't come as much of a surprise then that the MENA Foundation and the Ethereum Foundation actually partnered in February this year. Together, they plan to make it possible to use MENA's technology on Ethereum and will also be building a bridge between both blockchains. I suspect this partnership played a role in MENA's April collaboration with an Ethereum DeFi protocol, which makes it possible to take out under-collateralized loans in the DAI stablecoin by providing a zero-knowledge proof of your credit score. This is all amazing stuff, but I'd be lying if I said everything was looking bullish for MENA. There's no question that the MENA protocol has hit the ball out of the park when it comes to decentralization, but the same can't be said about its scalability and security. Those of you who watched my video about the fastest cryptocurrencies will remember that there are basically two ways you can measure speed, transactions per second and transaction finality. In an interview with Decrypt earlier this year, MENA protocol founder Evan Shapiro was pressed about how many transactions per second MENA's blockchain can handle. The answer was just 22 TPS. Now, I'm not a cryptographer by any means, but as far as I understand, this sluggish speed has to do with how those zero-knowledge proof snapshots are created. Not surprisingly, it takes a lot of computing power to create a zero-knowledge proof. In terms of time, it takes a standard computer about 30 seconds to do. What this means is that every MENA transaction takes at least as long as it takes for snarkers to create a zero-knowledge proof of that transaction. When you throw the bidding and selection process by the block producer into the mix, you end up with some pretty poor performance, which is also reflected in MENA's finality. As a quick recap, finality refers to the point at which a transaction can be said to be valid. The likelihood that a transaction is final increases with each block that is added to the blockchain. This is why you have to wait for all those confirmations when you're depositing your cryptocurrency onto an exchange. In case you're wondering, one confirmation corresponds to one block. On MENA, it takes 15 confirmations to be 99.9% .9 certain that a transaction is valid. This works out to one hour, which is about the same time it takes for a Bitcoin transaction to be considered final. Luckily, the team at O1 Labs has mentioned on many occasions that they are working on the scalability issue, and I'm confident that it will be resolved in due course. I haven't heard the same rhetoric from the team when it comes to MENA's security, however. Even though MENA's code and consensus mechanism has been audited by reputable firms, none of them has addressed an important question that I'm sure many of you were thinking earlier in the video. If verifiers only hold a zero-knowledge proof and block producers only store the current state of the blockchain, where the hell does all of MENA's blockchain history actually get stored? After all, you'd want to have the entire blockchain history if anything goes horribly wrong, right? A similar question exists on MENA's FAQ page, and the short answer is that the full blockchain history is not required because of how the protocol is designed. However, when I was reading through MENA's documentation, I came across what appears to be an unofficial fourth participant on the MENA protocol. This is the archive node, and as the name suggests, archive nodes are the ones responsible for storing the entirety of the MENA protocol's blockchain history. While the aforementioned answer from MENA's FAQ page downplays the importance of archive nodes, MENA's documentation notes that, quote, archive data is critical for applications that require historical lookup. On the protocol side, archive data is important for disaster recovery in that it is needed to reconstruct a certain state. In plain English, if any big problems arise on the MENA protocol, they need to reference archival node data to get the blockchain back up and running. I wasn't able to pin down how many archival nodes MENA has, but I couldn't help but notice 
that these archival nodes are apparently storing Mina's entire blockchain history on the Google Cloud. I don't think I have to explain what implications this could have for the security of the Mina protocol and the privacy of all its users. Now, in defense of Mina's developers, what they have built is on the cutting edge of cryptocurrency, and that is bound to come with a few trade-offs in the short term. When you consider everything the Mina protocol has accomplished and the potential it has, a temporary reliance on big tech storage is almost negligible. Keyword, almost. Mina protocol may be the world's lightest blockchain, but it has some of the heaviest tech you can find in cryptocurrency. Wrapping your head around zero-knowledge proofs is not easy, and the fact that Mina uses an even more advanced version of that makes it an objectively hard project for the average person to understand. The only reason that I was able to understand it was thanks to the analogy involving photos, which is almost the same as the one used by Mina's founders when they explain how their protocol works. Mina's blockchain is 22 kilobytes in size because it's just a digital snapshot of the entire blockchain. Some call it magic, and I reckon that's a pretty accurate term in this case, since there does seem to be some sleight of hand going on here. The small size of Mina's blockchain theoretically makes it scalable, secure, and decentralized. Right now, Mina doesn't seem to be very scalable. It doesn't seem to be very secure, and you could even argue that Mina isn't all that decentralized either. Now, this all depends on what definition of decentralization you're using. And this is where the magical sleight of hand seems to come in. Mina equates its block producers with Bitcoin miners and its verifiers with Bitcoin nodes. Because Mina has a lot of both, it's decentralized. There's just one problem, though, and that's that these are false equivalencies. Mina's archival nodes are much more similar to Bitcoin miners and especially to Bitcoin nodes. More importantly, archival nodes are arguably where Mina's decentralization actually comes from. Now, my understanding of decentralization is that there is no single point of failure, and the fewer points of failure there are, the more decentralized a cryptocurrency is. While I'm certain Mina has more than one archival node, if they're all storing Mina's blockchain history in Google Cloud, then that is a single point of failure. This would basically invalidate what Mina set out to do, which was to ensure long-term decentralization by maintaining a small blockchain size. Now, on that note, it's questionable whether blockchain size is really something to be worried about. The cost of data storage is getting cheaper, internet speeds are getting faster, and some cryptocurrencies like Solana have begun using decentralized storage cryptocurrencies to store their own blockchain history data. Still, there's no denying that Mina does truly have some cutting-edge cryptocurrency tech, and I have no doubts that what they're going to do in the coming months is going to change the crypto world forever. If you enjoyed today's video, then I've got three things to tell you. Hit that like button, smash that subscribe button if you haven't already, and give that notification bell a ring for good measure. Until the next episode of the Coin Bureau Hits the Tube, you can keep yourself busy by following me on Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram for memes and news. You can even join my free Telegram channel for daily crypto updates and subscribe to my weekly newsletter to make sure you don't make any crypto mistakes. If you want to support the channel, you can get your hands on some comfy crypto merch at the official Coin Bureau merch store. That includes this epic blockchain hoodie. Links to all these goodies are waiting for you in the video description. That's all for today, folks. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you again real soon.